Well, good afternoon. It's lovely to see you here. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Miles Berry. I work at the University of Roehampton, where my job is training the next generation of outstanding teachers. I've been doing that for four years now. Uh, before that, 18 years across four different schools, much of that time as a primary school ICT coordinator, three years as a head teacher, prematurely grey hair, not quite as old as I look, although rapidly approaching that point now. Um, I'm on the board of NACE, which is the ICT Subject Association. I'm on the board of Computing at School, Subject Association of Computer Science, and was part of the drafting team that put the new program study together. So blame me or thank me, but either way, you've still got to teach the stuff. Um, what I'm planning to do today, give you a bit of the context and then get into the nitty gritty detail of what the requirements are on the new program study and some of the tools, some of the technology that you can use to help children learn those things. And then with a little bit of luck, there'll be time at the end to talk about a few broader issues like teaching and assessment. We'll see how we get on. Okay, a little bit of a warm up icebreaker. Could you turn to the person who's sat next to you, please? and tell them what you think the school curriculum or your school's curriculum is for. Not the national curriculum, not the computing bit, the curriculum for your school. What's the purpose of that? What are you trying to do? I'm gonna wander around the room for a little while. Now the trainees at Roehampton hate it. Oh, I've got the thing at the desk now, thank you. Okay, the trainees at Roehampton hate it when I give them a question like that and then put the answers on the slide behind me. Here you go. This is what your school curriculum is supposed to do. So this is, I think, the 2002 Education Act. It's not changed much since the previous one. These are the statutory responsibilities on you as a school in terms of your curriculum to promote the spiritual, moral, cultural, mental, and physical development of pupils at your school and of society and to prepare pupils at the school for the opportunities, responsibilities, and experiences of life. If you're not doing that, you need a conversation with your head teacher on Monday morning, I would suggest, okay? Is there anybody who's starting to feel a little uncomfortable? Oh, oh, preparing them for opportunities in later life, I'm not sure that we're doing. No, of course not, okay? This is exactly what we do as schools, I think. You know, they've put into statute that which we would do anyhow, which is an easy law to abide by, yeah? Although how your school is, what is it? Ensuring the physical development of society is another matter entirely. I'll leave that as answers on the card. So what you have there is very much a future-facing thing. The development of the child, the development of society, and preparing for the opportunities of what comes next. They're good, that's a good list to aim for. The new national curriculum adds another layer on top of that. So yes, the statutory framework still applies. You still have to do the old stuff. But the new national curriculum adds in another layer. And it says that it provides pupils with an introduction to the essential knowledge that they need to be educated citizens and introduces them to the best that has been thought and said. Reference to Matthew Arnold, Culture and Anarchy there. Helps engender an appreciation of human creativity and achievement. Now, to my mind, that's kind of backward facing. Passing on the culture of a previous generation to the next. That's nothing wrong with that. I think that's a good thing for schools, for us as teachers to do. But I'm not sure that looking at what happened in the past and passing that on to the next generation is now the best way to prepare for those opportunities, experiences, and op what is it? Opportunities, responsibilities, and experiences of later life. The pace of change in culture, in society, in technology, in the environment is so fast now that just knowing how it was before and passing that on might in itself not be sufficient preparation. I don't know. But be reassured, paragraph 3.2 says doesn't matter. The national curriculum is just one element of the curriculum in the education in every child. There is time and space in the school day and in each week, term and year to range beyond the national curriculum specifications. Are you reassured by that? You should be reassured by that. You know, I don't get out into school enough at Roehampton, but we have the lesson plan form. From your teacher training days, do you remember the lesson plan form? You may still be having to fill in lesson plan forms, I don't know. And it says, what is your, no, what is your learning objective? That's fine. How does this relate to the national curriculum? If it was me supervising my trainees, I would say, you can leave that blank. I was just writing paragraph 3.2. This is the lesson where I extend beyond the requirements of the national curriculum. Yes, as long as you're a local authority maintained school, you have to teach the national curriculum, but you can teach whatever else you want 
as well. Nothing is prohibited. Everything is allowed. Some things are required, but anything you're interested in, you're passionate about, or your pupils are passionate about, do not wait to find the reference to it on the national curriculum. Get on, roll your sleeves up and teach them that. That's perfectly allowed. Paragraph 3.2 says so. Okay, take him at his word. What we have in the national curriculum, and my apologies to those who've seen this slide already, is the building regulations. You've got the responsibility to develop the architect's plans. And of course you can buy the architect's plans off the shelf and build the house like everybody, not everybody else, like other people are building houses. But you can design your own house too. Yes, it has to satisfy the minimum requirements, but you can do anything else in there. You can create your own schemes of work. You can create your own curriculum, which is fine as long as it satisfies the minimum requirements, the building regs. Make the most of the freedom that you've been given, please. Okay, relish the opportunity. How do you decide what to do? Well, William Morris, I think, had it right back in 1880. Don't put anything on there unless you know that there's going to be useful, remember, preparing for the opportunities of later life, or that you believe they're going to find it interesting. And as a rule of thumb for deciding what goes in, I think that's a good one. That's what we kind of tried to do with the new computing curriculum. Jim Rose, back in the last days of the previous government, um, was putting ICT at the heart of the curriculum as something essential for learning and life. We quite liked that idea, but getting away from it as a subject area in its own right. He did, however, have this definition of ICT capability. Those who've not just been to hear me talking about this already this afternoon, what on there is missing? If we take that as our definition, what do you notice he doesn't mention on there? Okay, those who were with me for the last part of the... Yeah, no mention of creativity. How could they have put together a definition of ICT capability which didn't acknowledge the importance of working creatively in digital media? Perhaps we took it for granted. Perhaps not. Perhaps we just forgot how important that was. The other thing, of course, yes, it says understanding here, but the focus is so much on the skills of using technology, and I think we've tried to move away from that. So look at what we have now. This is the starting bit of the new program of study. This is the first sentence. A high quality computing education equips pupils to use computational thinking, to start thinking like computer scientists or programmers, and creativity to understand and to change the world. Now that's ambitious. Compare and contrast. Look how far we've come in five years from when Jim Rose wrote that to where our ambition now lies. Notice this isn't about using computers. This is about understanding and changing the world. Okay, I hope you'll be able to do that, you know, hour a week on a Friday afternoon, and see how that goes. But let's be ambitious about what we're trying to do here. That's about preparation for the opportunities and experiences of later life. That's about the intellectual and other development of pupils in your school and of society. So what do we have? We have assessment for learning. People familiar with AFL, I'm sure. Yes, you've heard of that one already. Good, good, good. What about TFL, one which is less talked about? Transport for London, you were immediately thinking. Okay, meeting people where they are, taking them on to someplace new. What we have here is teaching for learning. Don't teach your pupils things they know already. It's a waste of your time, it's a waste of their time. Meet them where they are, take them onto a new place, like TFL kind of do, okay? So where are they? I don't know. You know them better than I do. But I reckon by the end of year six, they broadly speaking, in most schools, most of the time, meet the list on the left-hand side. They're good at using technology. They're good at consuming digital content. They're good as communicators of digital, uh, in a digital remote domain. They offer some values of digitally literate, digitally literate. They can keep themselves safe online, broadly speaking, and they have a host of skills. If you're teaching in a primary school, could you put your hand up, please, if that applies to your year six leavers? Ah, hands went down. Okay, I'm being too optimistic there. Where do we take them on to? From being users of technology to making technology. From users of content to makers of content. From consumers to creators of making YouTube videos, not just watching YouTube videos. From being able to communicate with one another to being able to work with one another online. That's a higher order skill, I'm sure of it. Yes, being digitally literate, 
but better being digitally critical, thinking about the business model, thinking about how the content's selected and whether it's something that's trustworthy. That's more important than mere digital literacy, I would suggest. And yes, they keep themselves generally safe, but how many of them act responsibly online? I think that's the step up. And yes, from moving from a set of skills to developing a deeper understanding. The Royal Society, you reported again about two years ago, said that the brand was damaged goods. I think their criticism applied much more to GCSE qualifications than it did to what we were doing down in the primary phase, to be fair, where ICT actually was pretty good, according to our friends at Ofsted. But they said the thing to do is to rebrand it. Who here is old enough to remember when Sella, Windscale became Sellafield? Okay, no way, I can't believe that. What about when Marathon became Snickers? Okay, uh, what is it, Opal Fruits became Starburst. Okay, what we're doing here is a rebranding exercise. ICT seen as damaged goods, let's relabel it computing. Okay, it moves the focus from working with information to computation, and I think that is something which represents a change of content as well as title. But, nevertheless, it's, it's largely a rebranding exercise. We're clearer about the content of the curriculum that it means both all three of these aspects. Yes, core essential digital literacy. I think the Royal Society definition is somewhat limited. Information technology, can you use the software? Can you use the computers to get something done? And then most significantly in terms of the change, do you understand how they work? Do you understand the fundamentals of computation? So you have those three aspects of the subject. And that's enshrined in the new program study. Here's the preamble for you. That the core of the subject is computer science that above and beyond that, the applications of that are in terms of children using information technology to create programs, to create systems, and a range of content. It's good to see that. But also children becoming digitally literate. And I think they've got a good definition of digital literacy, better than the Royal Society had, I would say that, wouldn't I? Able to use, but also express themselves and develop their ideas through ICT. Look, we mentioned ICT, I think we got away with it. Okay, at a level suitable for the future workplace functional skills, but also as active participants in, I would say, an increasingly digital world. So that's where we start from. The aims capture that idea. Notice that there are two which are related to computer science. One is about the ideas, the fundamental principles of computer science. The other is about the craft work of writing software. Can you analyze problems in computational terms? Have you had experience of writing computer programs to solve interesting problems? We then have an IT aspect, evaluate and apply IT, including new and unfamiliar technologies, but also being responsible, competent, confident, and creative users of ICT. Again, we mentioned ICT, I think it's twice now. Got away with it, okay? They took out the thing about being critical about this, which was a shame to my mind. So you have this structure to the subject. If you look through the programs of study, they're not color coded, they're not put into the sections, but you can see where the divide falls between the foundations, the computer science bits, how it's applied, the information technology bits, and also the implications of all this, which I see as a broader definition of digital literacy. And we'll have a look at that in some more detail. There you go. That's the bit which some of you have heard already. On to something a little bit new now. On to the Key Stage 1 program. Did you hear the Key Stage 1 people in the room? That's quite good. That's good numbers. Okay, this is on your list. These are the things you've got to teach. Okay? Secretary of State requires. These are not nearly as scary as people might once have thought. So, oh. Welcome to Sandwich Maker 2. I want to pause that. Okay, I'll come back and show you that. Okay, so Phil Bagg, who's presenting with me over in the arena, has this lovely way of teaching children what algorithms are by getting them to program him to make a jam sandwich. An algorithm is just a set of instructions or rules to get something done. It's bit after bit after bit is the way which we're going to teach it in Key Stage 1, I'm sure. Think about children getting ready for school in the morning. What are the steps that they follow? Think, if you will, about children getting ready to go out to lunch from your classroom. What are the steps that they follow? What are the rules that you have for that time of day? Think, if you will, of children getting, telling one another how to do something. If you will, of maths lessons, where you're teaching them an algorithm to solve certain types of problems. Welcome to Sandwich Maker 2001. <laughs> 
Right hand. Right hand, pick up red slice. <laughs> right hand, pick up red slice. Put down bread slice on plate. Put down bread slice on plate. Pick up jam jar with left hand. Pick up jam jar with left hand. Unscrew jam jar with right hand. Unscrew jam jar with right hand. Put, the, put down jam jar with left hand. Put down jam jar with left hand. Now put jam, jam lid down with right hand. Compute. Pick up. <laughs> you get the idea. Do this with your pupils back at school. Either do the jam sandwich bot yourself or get them to be the jam sandwich bot. We do it with trainees at Roehampton and have a whale of a time. The one instruction went, you know, Phil interprets the instructions very, very literally. I did very much worry about exactly what I should do when the trainees said, spread jam on bottom. It worried me. It really did. You know, list 99, here we come. Okay, you then get into how you put the algorithms into practice on digital devices. We said digital devices because if we said computers, people would think we meant laptops or big boxes with screens and black letters and so on. By saying digital devices, we meant this, microphone, this sort of computer too, yeah? It has input, it stores programs, it produces output. Which bit of your working definition of computer does it not meet, okay? So we have here a computational digital device and we can get people to write programs for it. Let's have a go at writing a program for it. Who's used one of these before? No, let's do it the other way around. Sorry, binary thing. Who's not used one of these before and would be willing to step up to the front? Thank you very much. Very complicated and sophisticated, okay? If you've been using these since nursery, then by the time they're in year two, they might be ready to try something a bit different, yeah? You might want to move on to something new. So what can you do? Well, you can go into Scratch. Um, what I should have done is to check this was working on the browser before we started. Let's do a new window on the browser and hope that, yes. So scratch.mit.edu is this amazing graphical toolkit from the lifelong kindergarten team at um, MIT in America. And it lets you build up programs by clicking Lego blocks together. Is there anybody in the room who's not seen Scratch? Okay, that's vanishingly small numbers. I think it was four years ago I was demoing this at the teach meeting. People thought, wow, what an amazing thing. Now it is uh, regrettably commonplace. Let's have a look at my stuff on there. I thought I had logged in once. Okay, my stuff please. Okay, so Scratch 2 now works on the web, unlike Scratch 1.4. The thing about Scratch 2 is it's Flash-based, so you can't use it on the old tablet computers. I'm looking for a thing called Bebop Sim. If you see it before I do, you must say. Um, debugging, various chickens crossing roads. I'm going to need the next page on here soon, aren't I? Let me just load another setup. Okay. Perils of coming in relatively close to the start of the session. Load more. I did, did you find it? Did you see it? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, RoboSim, maybe? Search results. Not helpful. Ah. Okay. I'm going to try once more, and then we're going to give up, and I'll just talk you through it. Okay, I'm sure it's on here. Sort by. Space Sim. Robo Sim, there it is. Okay, thank you. <laughs> patience, patience. Okay, so it's pulling down the Flash framework off the web. Once the Flash is running on your machine, you no longer need your internet connection, but it does take a while to pull that across. So here we are. What we have here, let me just change the costume so it looks something a little bit more familiar. Uh, back to the script here. Down the bottom, what I've done is use the tool you've got in Scratch 2 to create my own Scratch command. So I've defined forward, I've defined turn right, move backward, turn left. 
which gives children, young children very, very simple commands to start with in terms of moving from the toy onto the screen. Let's move the Beebot over here. Let's clear off one he made earlier and clear off that one as well. Which commands do you think we need to move the turtle, the Beebot, from here over to here? It's going to be forwards, it's going to be turns. Any suggestions? I'm not seeing volunteers yet. Somebody like to kind of give, it, give us a set of commands. So can I ask you? How many forwards? One forward moves it forward, one B-bot. You want, oh my goodness, that's, that's very impressive, using logical reasoning. So that's how far a forward is. Four, three of those forwards, let's move it back. To, move three forwards, turn right, and then do two forwards. Now this time I'm in control of the green flag and the button, so I can't let you start too early. Could you please point with your fingers, your own fingers, not a friend's fingers, to where you think Bebop will end up when we run that program? Okay. There are people pointing well over here. That's, that's optimistic, I think. Let's run the program. I hope you've used logical reasoning to make those predictions. No, you use your fingers to make those predictions. Here we go. Let's see what happens. Oh, it wasn't bad. Okay, let's pop him back where he started. Let's um, go in here, turn him back to facing the way it was. Any suggestions for how we can improve this program? Four steps forward, turn right, move forward two. I'm optimistic. That wasn't, that's was my fault for not setting the angle right. Okay, it's my mistake. But yeah, we're debugging a program. Yeah, we've found an error in the program and we fixed it. So that's easy to do. You can go beyond that. You can start using some of the key stage um, two commands so we can do a repeat loop. I can put repeat four times, move forward, turn right. Oops. Oops. I can put the pen down when I start. I can put Bebot somewhere in the middle of the screen. And now we're into territory which we can't do on the floor turtle, but this is extending familiar programming into a less familiar context. Anybody like to make a prediction about what this will do? Well, let's run it and see what we get. Just, I heard the word square, that's nice. There we go, and it did exactly what we're told. It followed the set of instructions it was given. So you've got all of that going on, understand what algorithms are, implement it as programs on digital devices, follows a sequence of instructions. We made a program, we debugged the program, job done. You then have, oh, you can do this on apps as well. Yes, Scratch won't work on the iPad, but other lovely things like the Bebot app and Daisy the Dinosaur, not Daisy the Cow, the two entirely different programs, um, will do those things for you. So, you know, tablets are an accessible option for this. Anybody here played Angry Birds? Oh, that's quite a few of you. How did you play Angry Birds without using logical reasoning to predict the behavior of simple programs? That's a requirement of the program of study. Playing Angry Birds is not, regrettably, a requirement of the program of study, but it's allowed. What better excuse for game-based learning than making predictions about how a computer game will behave when you do something? Yeah? And then that leads into Key Stage 2 work where you can get them making their own computer games. We then get into more of the IT territory in there. Who's using too simple software in your school? It's gorgeous. <coughs> gorgeous software, isn't it? Don't feel you have to stop using it because it's a computing curriculum. All of those programs still can be used, are still important for children to work with, together with those from other manufacturers and suppliers, I'm not biased here at all. Use technology purposefully to create, organize, store, manipulate, and retrieve digital content. Somebody got able to come up with an IT lesson where they were not using technology purposefully to create, organize, store, manipulate, and retrieve digital content. Because if so, that you're probably doing it wrong, but that would be very, very impressive. So all of that that you've been doing, you can carry on doing. And then, of course, recognizing common uses of IT beyond school. This used to be an early years statement. It's now there in key stage one of the curriculum, working on a project for Rising Stars over the other end of the hall on the switched on computing scheme of work, where we're starting with contexts and projects of how IT is used outside of school, and then thinking about ways of linking that to the computing program of study inside school. There's some examples of that. 
a lot better example of using IT beyond school than the phone or the pad or something like that. We don't require you to buy them, it's not listed on the program study, but this is a wonderful example of getting children to think about what these can do, how these are used and how they can keep themselves safe using these, I would say is something which is certainly you know, part of what you should be teaching if you're covering that bullet point. And then we get on to at last the safety requirement. Are you delighted that for once, come September 2014, September this year, it now becomes a statutory requirement for you to teach children how to keep them safe, self safe online? Yeah, up till now, I hope you've been doing that, but that's not because you've been told to do that. It only becomes part of the national curriculum this September, and about time too, I would say. Gorgeous resources from CEOP about using certainly focusing on the safety aspect about keeping yourself safe. I've not got time to show that now, so I won't show that now. On then to Key Stage 2. Key Stage 2 teachers in the room, please. Oh, lots of you. I'm going to just take a sip of water. And here you have the programming bits of the computer science bits of the Key Stage 2 curriculum. Let's have a look at those in some more detail now. So you have this ability to write programs that accomplish specific goals. And that's going to be, I mean, pretty much any program you're going to write is going to be about accomplishing a specific goal. Some of those should be about controlling or simulating physical systems. You don't have to rush out and buy the robotics kit, but there's a strong argument for getting some robotics kit in or sharing it with five partner schools or having some stuff where they can do this physically as well as on screen. The Lego we do stuff is gorgeous. It interfaces directly with Scratch and it's building blocks which you snap together. Learning through making is such a powerful thing in this curriculum area. Let me show you the video. Uh, this is from BBC Project Cracking Code. All of these videos are out there on the web. They start with real world contexts and then look at how you can take those ideas and use them in the classroom. In the same way that the crocodile fits together piece by piece, this computer code fits together like building blocks. All the commands you need on the left hand side of the screen, which you drag into the middle to write your program. For this program, we're going to need to use the sensing commands, which tell the crocodile when to shut its mouth. The sensor value tells you how far you are from the crocodile's mouth. As your hand gets closer to the sensor, the number decreases. So you need to check what number it goes down to when your finger is in its mouth. Now that the croc is programmed to know when to bite, we need to program it so it knows how to bite. So we need to write some code for the croc's motor so its mouth will open and shut. Great, so you've programmed yours to start biting your finger, right? Yeah. Okay, do you want to show me what you did? Okay. So as you can see, it's less than 20. It won't bite unless it's under 20. And So 20, that's the distance your yeah. finger is from the sensor? Yeah, so when it closes, it does it stays on for one second and then this way means it goes open so so it goes that way for one second and then this way oh, so it bites your finger for yeah. one second then it lets go yeah oh, okay and that's all down to your programming yeah oh, that okay and that's a lovely you know it's a link between the programming and it's a link between controlling physical systems you don't have to do it as control you can do it as simulation and that's interesting territory too I want to go on to the specific requirements. Remember, programming has been on the national curriculum right since 1988, 89, but now we have a specific list of what that includes. And let me illustrate that very quickly with a little scratch project here. So let's do a new one. And you've done the mental arithmetic starters. We use Skinner's algorithm. I'm going to ask you a question. If you get the answer right, I'm going to give you a biscuit. If you get the answer wrong, you don't get a biscuit. And we keep doing that until we've asked 10 questions or you've given 10 answers or something like that. Who's done that in their mental arithmetic starters? Okay, virtual biscuits, no real biscuits are involved. Health risk assessment, oh, nightmare. Okay, so you know the sort of thing. You can do game programming, but you can also do writing your own educational software. So very, very simply, Skinner's algorithm, I ask a question, what is, hardest question on the times table, anybody? Seven times eight, I'm hearing. Used to be seven eights, I think it's probably around eight twelves or nine twelves now, Gove has added a few more lines to it. Um, you know why the times table now goes up to twelve twelves, don't you? So that when he reintroduces pounds, shillings and pence, we'll be ready. Okay, so we ask a question, 
And then we're going to do an if-then loop, and we're going to see whether the answer's right. So I need to do a test in here. If the answer is... Um, what is 7 eighths, anybody? 54, something like that. Okay, then we're going to do, say, have a biscuit. Can't type when people are watching, look away now. If the answer is wrong, then we're going to say no. There's nothing wrong with saying no when people get it wrong. So let's have a go at this. What is 7 times 8? Well, it's 56. Oh no! Program's gone wrong. Anybody spot where the mistake is in my program? Were you spotting that as it was going through? You did spot that, didn't you? So let's have a go at doing that a little differently. 56. Here we go. What is 7 times 8? 50. Let's try 54. No, that was wrong. Try it again. What is 7 times 8? That's going to be 56. Have a biscuit. That seems to have tested that. That seems to be working. So far, not that brilliant as a mental arithmetic quiz. We're going to need to ask more than one question here, aren't we? Okay, because that's not going to keep them busy for the statutory 10 minutes. So let's ask the question 10 times. Repeat 10 times. Ask the mental arithmetic question. Check whether we've got the answer right. What is 7 times 8? It's 56. Another question. 7 times 8 is 56. Anybody suggest a way we could improve this program now? Okay. Changing the questions, that would be very sensible. Okay, actually reducing the time so that runs a little more quickly would be sensible too. So my problem is that this 7 times 8, I could write loads of questions and just run through the questions in order, sequence. Better is to get the computer to pick the questions. I'm going to pick the numbers. I'm going to call the first one A. I'm going to call the second one. That's a good choice. That's what I was going to go for. Okay. And then at the start of the loop, we're going to set those up randomly. So set A to be a random number between 1 and not 10 anymore, but 12 these days. And then we're going to have oops, data variables set B to be a random number between 1 and 12. Again, repeat. The, oh, the question's got to change this time. Let's join a few things together. What is A? times B question mark okay if only the voice recognition was working what is and then whatever's in that variable box A sorry I need to make that a bit small no I don't need to make it a bit smaller um, what is A space times space B and question mark okay so rather than asking that question, I'm going to ask this computer-generated question. What is a random number times a random number? Okay, any suggestions? For, will this work when we run it? What's the problem with this code? Which is going to happen about two times out of every 144. That's not good when it comes to SATS results, is it? So we need the computer to work out that answer. Now, novice programmers would put that in another variable, display that variable on screen. The game becomes very easy at that point. Um, so what I'm looking for is, if the answer is the correct answer, A, A times B, oh, here, A star B. Drag into the gap there. That looks good to go. Any suggestions for improvements? Sorry? Yeah, let's just see what happens. Well spotted, sir. Okay, so, uh, yeah, normally scratch things start with this green flag thing, don't they? So click on the green flag. What is 11 eighths? That's 88. Same question, what are the chances of that? Three times in a row. Okay, so my problem here, you spotted it already, is that I set those at the start. I should be setting them each time around the loop. Let's have a go now. Click on the green flag. 48, 15, and so on. We could start putting on a score, we could start putting on a timer. You could do something with the graphics, it's a bit dull at the moment, but we've got the basic logic of a drill and practice maths game. Who's using Education City or Mathematics in your school? Why not save your money and get the children to write those? Okay, okay, they do other things too. Um, so where do we go to from there? Well, I mean, look, what have we done? We've used selection, sequence. We have a set of instructions in order. We've used selection. We had an if then. We did one thing or we did t'other thing. We had repetition. We went round the loop ten times. We stored those two random numbers in variables. Various forms of input and output. I'm pushing my luck here, but I was typing. 
and the computer was putting things on screen. So one form of input, one form of output. I've covered pretty much the whole of that bullet point in what was that, about 10 minutes, seven minutes or so. What are you going to do with the rest of the four years? Plenty. Okay. And then, of course, the problems won't work the first time round. I made deliberate, they were really deliberate mistakes. You used logical reasoning to explain the errors in my simple algorithm and to detect and correct those errors in the algorithms and programs. So you were doing that as well in those seven minutes that it took to do that live demo of that. So well done. Again, what are you going to do for the rest of the four years? We could look at the Cracking the Code video, but I think I'm going to move on and show you some in other this bits. Program, Shh, we're using a bear Next slide, please. Okay. There is more to Key Stage 2 computer science than the coding bits. And I'm ever so slightly worried that when Rory Clefman Jones, great journalist that he is, talks about the new curriculum and when other people write about the new curriculum, they say, it's teaching children to code. We've been doing that since 88, 89. It's actually teaching them computer science and other aspects of computing that we're doing. So don't focus just on the coding bits. There are other bits there too including bullet points like this, to understand a computer network, including the internet. That's by the end of year six, folks. If you thought the coding bit was ambitious, understanding the internet by the time you leave primary school, I think that's really ambitious. But it's good to be ambitious. It's good to teach them things they don't know already. A year five child comes up to you at break time and says, Miss, uh, they would know which. What's the difference between the internet and the web? Who's got a good response for me? Sit down and get on with your SATs practice. That's always a good response. Anybody like to have a go? Got a microphone here, not afraid to use it. Not bad. The internet is the connection between, both are about connections, okay? The internet is about connecting computers together. The web is about connecting documents together. The little blue links are the thing that makes the web what it is. We had 20 years of the internet before Berners-Lee spotted you could use it for linking documents on one computer to documents on another computer. And how, what a difference that made. If it wasn't for the web, who'd be excited about the internet? Seriously, if it wasn't for the internet, who'd be excited about computing? I can't believe that we were back in the days of the BBC Micro. Um, so yeah, if you're going to teach that, get them, get them to draw. Sorry, get them to draw the internet. What do they think the internet is? It doesn't have to be full scale. You know, you'll get different pictures. Some will draw computers connected together. Some will draw Facebook icons or Internet Explorer icons or web pages. This difference between the documents it passes to and fro and the connectivity, the hardware, that makes all of that possible is something which contributes to that understanding. But also, of course, the implications of that, how we can use that for communication, for collaboration. I've not got time to show you that video, but yeah, why not get them to make web pages? It's coding, it's not programming, because you can't do computation merely through writing HTML. But what a great way to get them moving beyond Scratch to thinking about a symbolic language. And the stuff you do on the left there in HTML causes the appearance of the web page over there on the right. This is using Mozilla's Thimble toolkit. And get, who's taking part in Julia Skinner's 100 word challenge? Or five sentence challenge? Isn't it brilliant? Such a good thing. You get children, Julia puts up a, a, a stimulus, a story prompt, and the children use their blogs to respond in, oh, I forget what the rules are. There must be a clue some. Oh yeah, it was a hundred words. What a great opportunity for communication, for collaboration. And then we got onto search technologies. Is there anybody in the room just out of interest who doesn't use Google as their search engine of choice? What are you using? Uh, Firefox will be your web browser. Where do you go to search for pages? Thought it would be Google. Anybody else? Okay, isn't that worrying? Yeah? Never since the Reformation has one organization created, uh, controlled more people's access to information than Google do now. Be aware that there are alternatives. But what's their business model? How does it work? How does Google choose what to put up at the top of the page? Broadly speaking, it's the number and quality of inbound links. Yes, there are paid results. The top three on this page are all through sponsorship, but placing that advert has cost three or E or O2 
nothing. It's when you click on that advert that money changes hands, that money goes from, from them to Google. So if a company really annoys you, just Google them and keep clicking their adverts. That'll cost them, okay? <laughs> um, where was I going with that? Oh yeah, and so of course Google want to place the best possible adverts up there. They want to give you adverts which you will click on, which is why they want to know as much as they can about you. Okay, they promise they're not evil, and I believe them, I really do believe that they're not evil. But the business model, why they do this for free, is because they're gonna sell us, or sell advertising to people. And they're getting children to be discerning in evaluating digital content. Let me swap out and get back into my web browser. Does anybody, did anybody ever use that, what is it, the Tree Octopus page? About, you know, spoof internet pages and getting people to think about that. Get children to make their own spoof pages. Go into the, what is it, the, it's, this is another Mozilla tool, this is um, X-Ray Goggles, which lets you take a web page and start hacking the content there. If you're not comfortable with us changing the name, you get to change it. So National Curriculum in England, Computing Programs of Study, ICT Programs of Study. There we go, one government website hacked in front of a live audience, okay? I'm not. I believe me, hacked the government's web server here. I've, done, I've changed the content of the pages displayed in my browser. But in, I, last time I was presenting this, somebody said, but Miles, aren't you teaching them to deface websites or whatever? You know, what about copyright here? Open government license, you're allowed to do that to anything the government produce, okay? As long as you're not sort of passing it off in their name. So, you know, get them to make spoof pages, make changes there. Um, play from current slide, unconscious of time passing, folks. Um, the last bit of Key Stage 3 is back into more familiar territory for most of us. This bullet point here is a whole train wreck of drafting. They've put at least three bullet points all together in one very, very long sentence. I don't think that's effective use of English. If I was marking their SATS papers, I would not be very happy about giving them a level five for that sort of work. I really wouldn't. Okay, so let's break it up into its clauses and look at each of those. Select use combined software on a range of devices, including web servers, okay? It doesn't have to be a digital device that's in front of you. Design and create program systems and content which accomplish given goals. Again, what bit of ICT that you've ever been teaching has not done that. Notice though the reference to systems there, that's another really ambitious bit of the new program of study. That used to be level eight on the old orders, and we've brought it down into key stage two now. And then collect, analyze, evaluate, and present data and information. Now, I know if there are people in the room teaching A-level ICT, you have your own weird, peculiar definitions of data and information. For me down here in the primary phase, data is the numbers and the information is the text and okay, the pictures and the video and the sound files as well. But working with numbers matters and that's gonna matter more and more over the next few years. So getting them used to working with big data sets. Don't do the class survey of how, what color eyes have you got, what color hair have you got, how tall are you? Firstly, that's personal data and you need to be registered under the Data Protection Act. But secondly, there's really lovely, interesting data out there that you can download and use. Like how much every single primary school in the country spent on every bit of their budget line for the, for the financial year 2010-2011. Why not get children doing something interesting with that data? There are lovely tools out there for doing that sort of thing. Google Apps for Education is one. Um, Microsoft Office 365 is another. Next slide, please. And of course, you've got the tablets, you've got the phones. You know, even if you're not letting them use them at school, then getting them to recognize what they can do with that at home, if they have them at home, is part and parcel of that. And of course, we have the safety statement in there. And the added word here, the extension beyond Key Stage 1, is about responsibility. And I talked about that at the beginning there. I am essentially out of time. So what I'm going to do is slip out of the slide deck, put up my contact details at the end, and hang around to answer a few questions. Thank you all ever so much for being so patient this afternoon. Thank you.